G'day and welcome to The Call, 10 stocks picked by you, two experts, one hour. It is Friday the 14th of January. I'm Andrew Gagan. Great to have you along for the ride. Let's introduce our guests joining us, Carl Kapalinga from Think Markets and Claude Walker from A Rich Life. Welcome to both of you. And uh, Carl, thanks. You've stepped in a very short notice, so a bit of cramming going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good afternoon, Andrew. Good afternoon, Claude. A little bit of cramming. Yeah, I've had a, had a quick look at the, the list of stocks today. Some very interesting ones in there. I we don't uh, cover many of them, so I'll do my best yep. uh, on what they do. But I think I'll focus today mainly on the charts, and maybe uh, we can talk about some of these uh, little setups and some maybe some educational bits and pieces as well. Yeah, fair enough. Um, now, of course, uh, we're seeing everything play out at the moment uh, stock-wise, given where inflation is going, the prospect of uh, rising rates. Um, Carl, do you want to be in tech at the moment? Uh, yeah, it's tough, tough gig being in tech. So obviously, when interest rates go up, those uh, high PE, high flying technology shares, uh, high PE just means high price compared to their earnings. And often those earnings uh, will come. And that's the thing. I mean, it's not that it, just because they're technology and they've got a high PE doesn't make them a bad stock. The deal is that 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 E is going to come down the track. So the E is going to go up. And if you buy today, you effectively got a fixed P. Uh, so your P is fixed and E is going to go up, but the E is coming down the track. And when interest rates go up, the, um, the amount you discount those future earnings back to present value. I know this is sounding a bit complicated, but this is ultimately why share price, prices are what they are today. This is what the big institutions are doing. The higher discount rate, higher interest rates, the lower your present value. And that's why tech stocks are suffering today. So yeah. uh, I do think interest rates could go a bit higher, unfortunately. So maybe there's a little bit more pain. But if you can still focus on solid companies where the earnings are going to come, I think we'll get through this bit. And there's st- you know, you, you still can hold tech stocks. It's not we can't say you, you can never, never hold tech stocks ever again. That's silly. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Claude, how are you feeling about tech at the moment? Well, I'm glad that Carl uh, said it's going to, the pain's going to end sometime because um, I think <laughs> I, I've had a terrible six months uh, just due to my um, large exposure to tech. Obviously, in the course of the last uh, decade or so, um, it's been a great decision to focus my energy on uh, investing mostly in tech and healthcare um, and, you know, a few other things as well. In, but, you know, that's been a big focus for me. But, oh, my gosh, you know, that has been pa- painful six months for me. Um, you know, first, all of the uh, more risky tech stocks that perhaps don't make a profit and were a bit highly priced, a bit rich, highly priced. Everyone was a little bit uh, too excited just because the price was going up. The same thing affects me. I'm like, oh, I don't want to sell this one. It makes me feel good. It goes up every day. Um, you know, those companies tend to come down first. And then some of the stalwarts that are actually really profitable, high quality business. They took a bit longer, but now we're starting to see them um, come down as well. So it has been a, a rough uh, time for my portfolio. Mm. But, you know, on the flip side, that's why it is some, you know, important to make sure that one, um, you know, has things invested outside the stock market. And certainly after the strong run we had from 2020, I had taken a fair bit out as I just trimmed some of those winners. Um, that has sometimes, you know, doubled or, or, or more, mostly on multiple expansion. So I think it always helps to know where the gains are coming from. A general rule of thumb is that fundamental growth um, will probably stick with you long term. And maybe that's something you can count on. But when you've got your wins just from um, margin expansion, then it's going to go the other way at some point. Yep. Well, as you say, it's all about spreading the risk at this point in particular. All right. Well, let's get to our stock of the day. And we're looking at retail clothing group. City Chic out with a trading update with both revenue and active customers in double digits, earnings in line with the prior cost running period, tracking about $23 million. Uh, Chief Executive and MD Phil Ryan saying he's pleased with the trading results for the first half with strong revenue growth in all regions, despite well publicised labour shortages and impacts to global logistics and supply chains. And today it is up 12% as we speak. Claude, City Chic, what are your thoughts? Well, um, obviously, it was a good update. Uh, well, no, I don't know how good it was, but the market really loved the update today where they basically, uh, you know, perhaps soothed any fears around supply chain issues. It seems like, you know, they've been quite forward thinking and building up their inventory and they're still, they still say they have a strong inventory and they're building that, um, which has meant that they can keep selling um, even, you know, in the face of those fears. Um, they 
having said that, I personally didn't think that necessarily the actual uh, the numbers were particularly impressive. So basically, what they're saying is that their underlying EBITDA, which is a pretty mm, questionable metric, but let's just use it because that's what they've given us, um, is in line with the prior correspondent period. And they say this is a good thing because they had, uh, you know, an impact from store closures and, and stuff like that. But, you know, at the same time, like, I think over the last few years, we're just going to see this evolution of companies that are always like, oh, don't worry about, you know, ignore the influence of the pandemic on our operations. Um, obviously, it has a mixed bag, gets more online sales, less in-person sales. You got stimulus that gives people more money, all of these things. I think we need to move past the point where we're just backing out, like, the, the pandemic this is the world we live in at some time it, it will be less of an issue for us but whether it's waves of variants whether it's you know less international travel whether it's more work from home there are a lot of these things that there's not going to be some day when like some one declares the pandemic over and then like mm. oh then you get back to have your other financial results so i just tend to put that aside these days i don't think yep. the numbers were that great um but that was what happened today you know zooming out these guys are a um in arguably a roll up of sort of plus size retail is their is their speciality and a few years ago uh they really were nothing much to look at and then they got a new management team a few years ago they've done a few uh, disposals and then acquisitions built up the profit and uh, made it more of a global company and and then you know at the end of last year the cfo uh, left the company sort of unexpectedly and i, I think that that maybe you could see that sort of effect in the chart maybe people started worrying a little bit all right i think we've lost uh claude there uh for the moment um sorry about that let's come back see if carl are you still with us I'm still here, I will, if, you, if you got me. So, sorry, Claude, I think we have a bit of a technical issue there. I'll just get you to finish. Can you hear me, sorry? Yep, yeah, we got you back, sorry. Oh, I beg your pardon. Um, I'm not quite sure where you lost me, but you know, I was basically saying I think it's expensive for what you could argue is essentially a roll up of retailers. And, and yep. that's kind of the note I was going to finish on. All right, okay, so what are you doing with it? Uh, for me, I. I don't tend to love to hold retailers at all. So for me, it would be a sell. Okay. But that doesn't mean it's a bad company. Okay, fair enough. Carl, <laughs> what are you seeing? Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't think it's a bad company at all. I think it's actually quite a good company. I mean, there's, there's as, as Claude correctly suggests, so it's a plus size retailer, um, but a big proportion of their sales is online, I think about 71% now online. Uh, they do have some real sort of areas of growth within the business in uh, the US, in Europe, uh, in the Mid East even, um, some, some really underserviced uh, areas of the world. And, and that's where sort of the, the upside, the X factor could come from uh, in terms of their bread and butter, which is their Australian operations uh, and some of the, um, uh, the bricks and mortar operations. Uh, clearly uh, struggling with what's going on with COVID. So I think if you look at the, the big dip in the chart, that's more to do with this explosion um, of cases, obviously on the East Coast. Um, part of it all is also the supply chain issues. So um, that's tricky. I mean, they did make a big move into inventory sort of uh, late last year, um, almost anticipating that something could go wrong. So that has helped them. Um, but margin pressures, I think, are the, the key things going forward. So uh, long story short, there's enough uncertainty here to, to keep this on away from a buy. It's, it, I don't think it's a buy. Um, looking at the price action today, very impressive. So, you know, big yeah. bounce today off what is, uh, you know, short, a well entrenched short term downtrend it's 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 enough um, based upon that that bounce today if we close near the highs it's kind of a big if so let's assume we close say around five dollars um given the volume and the price action i would suggest we've made a low um but there's too much risk in the chart and there's too much uncertainty around um just what's going on with the business for me to call mm -hmm. it by so i think it's it's a hold so i, okay. I guess people no doubt are listening who have it i would hang on to it on the basis that there is a quality business there with some growth um, but there's too much uncertainty okay that's city chic now let's get into the stocks as picked by you the first one sensen now this is fuel theft reduction solutions um, it's tech essentially preventing preventing drive-offs at service stations which does address a significant problem. I think it's estimated that about 
$60 million plus is lost by Australian operators. Now, Adam wanted to know, he says it's been up and down for the past six months. He's wondering if it can have a breakthrough which will propel it upwards. Claude Sensen. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so it does, that's a good, you gave a great example of the kind of stuff it does, but also I guess more broadly than that, you could abstract it to, um, you know, video analytics perhaps. So a couple of other examples of the um, their customer success stories as they like to call them, uh, the fact that they, that Singapore uses uh, Sensense technology to monitor the most vulnerable um, sites in its traffic network for road blockages or dangerous drivers, accidents, or even such things as mobile phones losing using uh, drivers using their mobile phones, right? So like, it's kind of a little bit big brothery there. Uh, something that uh, occurred to me years ago, it's actually been listed for quite some time. Um, but there's other reasons as, uh, as well. So it has that same video technology, yes, as um, for protecting fuel. Um, but also, you know, in casino, they casinos, they use video tech to like monitor the number of chips and, and how much people are betting and um, in blackjack and poker, I, I guess maybe to check the cheating and that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's an interesting company. And look, I've never, I've never really vibed with the way that it presents itself. So, for example, its name is its website is sensen.ai, and its catchphrase is um, "solving the impossible." And to me, it just feels a little bit buzzwordy, and always has it. And it's been a little bit listed for a few years now, and sometimes it's been quite hyped up in those times. Having said that, you know, that is perhaps the older impressions I had. What it's done is it's done recently a couple of acquisitions, two acquisitions. And, um, you know, on the downside, that's seen multiple dilutions. So at the beginning of last year, um, it raised $7 million at $0.12 cents per share. It's recently done, an, uh, sorry, $0.12.5 cents per share. It's recently done another raise at $0.12 cents per share. It issued shares, that I think, about $0.10 or $0.11 cents per share for one of these acquisitions at least. Um, which is ScanCam, and you talked about that. And basically, it has, through acquisition and a bit of growth, managed to really bolster its revenue now. So it has um, actually guided for revenue of um, 11 million up on 5 million last year. Now, I don't know if um, it's going to achieve that, but you know, I do think that uh, it is getting more interesting because if it achieves that, then it has a more substantial revenue. It has proved itself out a little bit. And that's what I'd be looking for. So mm. generally speaking, I have to say in the past, I've kind of discarded this one. I see there's too much dilution, not enough organic growth, obviously still making a loss. So yeah, that's it's a bit too risky for me. But now with its recent acquisitions, I could see a scenario where it actually does become a successful company. So. Um, I like it, but um, I'll, I'll give it a miss for myself. And if it goes really well, I'll just say, um, look, you, you can't pat all the fluffy dogs. And, and at least I've got, I've got this one here, so I'll pat that one. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. No patting the fluffy dogs for you on that one. Uh, Carl, its uh, share price, it's off about a quarter, uh, 25% over the past 12 months. Yeah, look, I mean, I love, um, I like, I like this actually. Drop, getting dropped into the hot seat at the last minute. Uh, this is a stock I hadn't heard of until I, I got the list. Um, but I like listening to what Claude has to say and the way he says, "Look, it's an interesting company. Yes, they've had lots of dilutions, haven't made a lot of money, but there's, uh, there, you know, there's something going on there, and and, and it, it's very prospective into the future." Because the chart explains exactly that. So. Um, without knowing what it did, Claude's explanation explains this chart. I, I think there's something going on here. I think I can, you know, I'm not I think I can, but I can see uh, building volume. So the building interest. So it had a period there through sort of May to November, very, very quiet on the volume, as in hardly any interest at all. And volume on the chart is a bit like volume on your stereo, right? So if you've got it down very low, nobody can hear you. If you crank it right up, the people across the road can hear you, okay? So volume is interest. Uh, so there's interest coming back into this. Why? Hey, I don't know. I didn't do the research on the stock, but I can tell you whoever is looking at the stock is doing the research and they're going, things are getting better here I need to start to accumulate uh, now the problem is there's plenty of supply because it's been a dog for such a long time and we need to work through that supply and the only way to get through that supply is to trade with them and that's what the volume is doing um, as you say it's up over the last uh, couple of weeks it tells me that some of that supply overhang 
we, we've eaten through that. In fact, there's less and less supply and the demand that's in the system, I know there's demand in the system so I can see the volume, is now starting to impact uh, on prices to the upside. So that is interesting. Um, the trends are just starting to turn up. It's not completely visible from that chart, but it certainly is on mine. Uh, I'm not going to call it a buy because, as Claude says, it's, it's maybe just not ready yet, um, but I'll let the market give me the cues on this. I think if it closes above 16, um, I think if you can do that with a bit more volume, a bit more interest in there, it's going to look very, very interesting. So it'll be one I'll come back and look at. If you've got it, absolutely hang on to it, but I can't quite call it a buy just yet. Okay, so you're holding it. Fair enough. Sensen. Let's move on to our second stock. This is Archer Materials uh, Nanotech. Uh, now it's biochip technology, has uh, nucleic acid markers. Now they're used for monitoring a person's health to see if disease is present. Sol wondering, uh, he says he has a small speculative position in it and he's down almost 40%. So he wants to know essentially to weigh up the risk reward on the company. Claude. Cool. Well, I think Sol's got it right in the sense that it's definitely a speculative position. Uh, this company, uh, you know, I think it's probably best if I just refer to it as like a high tech company uh, in, in semiconductors because I don't fully under, understand the science that they say they have that is, is valuable and is going to somehow make them money, but they don't currently make money from this technology. Um, and they do have expenses, of course. And, you know, previously, I think they were a mining company and they've offloaded some of those tenements. And so I feel like that this company is one of those classic little uh, listed vehicles that they switch between being a, a SaaS company and then um, a mining company and then a biotech company. And they're just like in that evolution, I guess. And that's definitely something I tend to avoid. And actually, um, it's actually great that we have Carl today because... Uh, this is exactly the kind of stock that I don't think my fundamental analysis is actually going to be that useful. Like my fundament, fundamental analysis will say this is an overvalued business, right? It will definitely say that. But, you know, I don't think that valuation is what's controlling the share price of this. It's definitely outside of my, like this is popular on, say, Reddit or um, Facebook. People love it. And, you know, they say they're, uh, they do the, a lot of things that I definitely make me go, oh, no, thanks. Like they said, um, in October that they're entering a new era of growth as a pure play deep tech. I mean, to me, that is just red flag galore. I'm like, oh, that sounds really like um, something that I'm not that interested in, especially if it has no profits or revenue. So, you know, for me, not my style, but I'd love to hear what um, char um, what Carl thinks of the, uh, of the chart, basically, because I think yep. that probably just momentum and sentiment is the most important thing here. All right, so you're avoiding it. I should point out, Claude, it is in the portfolio at the moment. Oh. So... I think on your on your call, it's actually going to tip out. But oh, anyway, let, let's hear from Carl. Uh, oh, that's good. The, pres the pressure's off me. So that <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, look, uh, Claude's right. I mean, the stocks, um, I like the way he sort of talks about this idea of um, I've got a core portfolio. Um, each one has probably a higher weighting than, say, I've got a speculative portfolio where they've got risk money bets in them. And, you know, that core portfolio, you know what they do. You know them inside out. And, uh, you know, obviously you track them along. And, and uh, the announcements they make as they go along, are those announcements meeting your expectations, um, the reasons why you got in? I, I, I like that idea. Um, and then I like this idea of having sort of some spec, spec money where you've got risk only bets and you know you, you need one out of five potentially, or one out of 10 to be uh, fantastic and, and that'll, that'll pay for some losses on the other ones. And I think Archer would fit into that second category. So um, it will be more about sentiment. It'll be more about momentum. It'll be more about what's going on on Reddit. Um, what I can say from the chart is there is something going on here. So a bit like the last one, which was sort of uh, warming up. Um, this has had a you know, massive, massive jump yesterday from about a dollar, I'm going to say dollar two, hit a high of 138. So, you know, 35% jump in a day on huge volume. So something uh, substantial has occurred. Now, once we have these big rallies like that, they really are markers on a chart for you to take notice. Um, don't ignore those big moves up. A lot of people will say that has gone up too much and then just go to the next one. There's a reason why it's gone up. There's this sort of fundamental techno tectonic shift. What you need to do is watch that stock over the next few days. Hey, if it fades back the next day, another, you know, if it fades back to where it started the next day or the day after that, 
there's nothing more to see here. Now you can move on. But if it holds up at those levels, see, the thing is, this stock has been in, a, and we can see um, that's sort of a compressed chart there. But for the last um, six months, it has been in a well entrenched downtrend with people selling, 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 and the hodlers getting more miserable every day, right? So we have this huge bounce, and, and that bounce allows some of the hodlers to finally get out, maybe at a smaller loss or maybe at break even. They're not getting out. That's the thing. When you have these huge rallies and you don't get that pullback, it's telling you that the money is sticking with this one. So fresh mm. money's coming in and the old money is staying with it. They're not jumping out. So I think you need to take take notice. I can't call it a buy now because as I said, I need to watch over the next few days. Yeah. But the price action I'm seeing today is very encouraging. It's holding strong. And if you can hold strong around this level and then start to push up, I think that's when you get onto it. So it's it's if you've got it, absolutely 100%, hang onto it. Something is up here. If you don't, keep a close eye on this over the next few days. Okay, so it's a hold or a watch, as the case may be from you, Carl, but unfortunately, Claude is avoiding it. So on that basis, it's out of the portfolio, but we'll yep. keep an eye on it. Okay, sorry, our third sorry, stock. speculative funders. Yeah, yeah, our third stock, IGO. Kim wanting to know about this. It is all about nickel, copper, lithium. It's those battery metals that uh, we know what's happened over those for the past uh, year or so obviously given the electrification of the planet um, and it's uh, pumping at the moment carl let me come to you um mm -hmm. how are you seeing igo at the moment just uh, taking a look at the chart and uh what it's i mean you know it's the top your, your classic uh, bottom left top right isn't it oh look absolutely i mean this is probably the best chart on the ASX. And it's been that way for a considerable period of time. So uh, yes, they're a nickel producer, um, a substantial nickel producer, and about to become more substantial with the acquisition of Western areas. But they also produce copper. Uh, they also produce cobalt. And uh, they've got a substantial interest in the Greenbush's lithium mine as well. So uh, let's recap. Nickel, copper, cobalt, and lithium are uh, all in the same boat and that is about as good as you can get right now obviously with the uh, ev revolution that is uh, that is before us so uh, it has been a great performer we have been a champion of this stock here at uh, think markets for for a considerable amount of time i think uh, literally one of the first stocks i put as a buy uh, when i came on board with think markets and we've maintained a buy since then it's still a buy for me i don't think it's expensive i, you know, I still think um, a lot of the big brokers and big research houses out there have have very bearish views on a lot of these commodities because yes they have spiked but the natural um expectation is that you know because this you know there's a cyclical nature of these commodity prices they'll come down so a lot of these um, big mining companies are trading on very very low pe's for that reason um and if commodity prices don't come down even if they just stay flat for a period of time then i do think stocks like igo are undervalued so that's kind of the fundamental evaluation basis but the chart yeah, i think is reflecting that as well it's just you know it's just a wall of demand uh hitting a lack of supply uh why is there a lot of demand for all the reasons i talked about why is there so little supply why do igo shareholders not want to part with their shares unless the price goes higher and higher and higher to, to compensate them more for their opportunity well, because they think there's more opportunity there so um, look it's still a buy for me it's been a buy for a period mm. of time and uh, if you've got it hanging in there okay claude do you like it uh, look, I am not a mining analyst, and, I, and that's not my circle of competence. So I actually just don't really invest in mining companies. But if I was going to invest in a mining company, then this is actually the kind of thing that I would be interested in. Look, I think Carl has actually done a really good job of explaining the bull case. So I won't go over it weaker, but I will make um, the sort of generalized points about why this is the kind of thing that I would buy, potentially, if I did buy mining companies. Basically, I like the idea of our natural resources as a hedge against inflation. And secondly, I like um, the fact that these guys are diversified and profitable. So look, you can argue about the price, it could be too high, it could be um, too low, and that will depend partly on commodity prices. But in an inflationary environment, commodity prices should go up. And in that case, the, uh, the in shareholders will probably do well. So yeah, look, I would with the caveat being that I'm not a, I'm not a mining company investor, you know, I would give this as close to basically saying buy as I ever would for a mining company. Okay. All right, qualified buy. But it is two buys, and that means it is going into the portfolio. Well done, Claude. You got it there. Okay. 
On to our. Yeah, no, no, I don't feel bad about it. I thought uh, I wasn't in a mining investment anyway. <laughs> Just rely on on uh, Carl's analysis there. All right, Globe International. That's our fourth stock. Harley wanting to know about this. Um, originally starting out as a skateboard equipment importing business. Um, it's got a number of brands now, which includes apparel and footwear, and obviously also skating. Um, and I should also note that, Claude, it is in the portfolio. Well, I'm glad okay. that I'm glad that for once I'm not going to change it out of the portfolio because I, I actually quite like this one. Um, but it is certainly more the kind of business that I invest in. So um, these guys are essentially brand owners who are in the sort of skating brand owners. Globe is one we know, but like also one that's been doing really well um, lately is Impala, the um, the roller skates um, uh, brand that is quite popular if you look on social media and Instagram and that kind of thing. And look, in zooming out, this is essentially the kind of business I look for and I have in the past owned it. Unfortunately, I've not actually done particularly well at this. I sold it actually right before it sort of started taking off. So uh, no credit to me there. But um, the reason that I sort of did own it is because this is like a founder run company uh, that has, I guess, aligned board and management, uh, long term style, ma- um, you know, that, that the reason that is a good thing is because it means that they run the company more for the long term, like they're not in it to like make money um and then leave so that is a real positive and then the other thing is basically uh they have had a really uh fortunate fortunate time where the kind of like skating and stuff has gone in a real renaissance during the pandemic because that kind of like outdoor activities um has become more popular and those that it's just like more in trend like i can't explain it but if you look around on your social media you've got a lot more young people um, you know, I feel like seven years ago, never when I was a kid, you hardly it was dying out. You hardly saw people roller um, skating, but now it's all popular. People love to fo- post photos of themselves roller skating at the beach or whatever it is. So um, that has gone in their favor. They've got operating leverage has come through. I think I don't look. They got a their profit has been a little bit lumpy, and because it is partly due to increasing the value of inventory. Like you can't extrapolate the current levels of profit going forward so even though if you look it up it'll say it's a p ratio of 7.8 it is but that's because um you know it's just had a particularly good year uh and it won't repeat that having said that i still think it's a good company probably you know the the five percent dividend yield does is probably more close to being something that could be a guide to the value there and I guess for me, you know, it's still small. So 262 million, it's got a tight float, rather fu- um, founder dominated. So if it just keeps on getting this sales momentum, and I don't know that that will happen, but if mm. these trends, skating coming back in, if that holds, then I think that these guys, they've got brands, they'll, they'll probably have pricing power, so they'll probably be okay in an inflationary environment. It's more like, a, it's kind of a luxury to have a really nice skateboard or skates or whatever. And so I actually do think this is probably the kind of business that um, I don't personally own it, but I, I like it. So it's a buy? I'd call it a buy, yeah. But, okay. you know, just with the caveat being, I don't have my money where my mouth is on that one, but I still <laughs> like the business. Yeah, Carl, what are your thoughts? Yeah, look, certainly um, from a technical perspective, it looks very good. I mean, it's very much bottom left, top right over the long term. It's a bit of a short term downtrend that's developing. Uh, with some candles that ordinarily I wouldn't like. So they're the big black candles on the chart. But it's such a thinly traded stock, I'm prepared to sort of um, give it the benefit of the doubt on the, on the basis of the long-term trend. What I can see certainly in volume in the volume um, and, and price action is, is a lot of accumulation that's occurred. So there was a period in sort of uh, August, September, um, and then with, with uh, a significant accumulation, then price increase. Uh, there was a period before that sort of December, late December 2020, um, so it, it's just lacking a little bit of um, a little bit of interest at the moment, and I think that's why the share price is falling back. Uh, it is falling back to sort of a reasonable sort of value zone on the chart, but without some of that upside price action, that, without some of that volume, I can't call it a buy. I think if you've got it, there's certainly enough in there to hang on to it. Uh, if you don't have it, there's you know there's, there's going to be other things that that are going to 
you know, look more attractive than this one uh, from a technical perspective. I know from, from the fundamentals, I know uh, looking at a lot, of, a lot of their brands that they have, I know my kids, I've got one that's 10, one that's 12, and they're uh, they're loving these brands and all, all the friends do as well. So it's, uh, you know, they're, they're a cashed up little consumer base, I'll tell you what, uh, after Christmas, Christmas money. <laughs> Where's all that money going? I know exactly what you're talking <laughs> about right there. Uh, all right, well, on that basis, you've got to hold on it. Um, and Claude, as a, as a buy, it is in the portfolio. That is where it stays. All right, moving on to Can Group. Archie wanting to know about this. Uh, it is uh, all about uh, medicinal cannabis. In fact, it's recently constructed its um, cultivation facility in Mildura. Um, and it's uh, been under a uh, capital raise also, just uh, as far as funding some of that construction is concerned, seeing market opportunities in both Europe as well as here in Australia. Claude, Can Group. Yeah, so for me, this one's a good example of the stuff that's just like way out there on the risk spectrum, way beyond the kind of thing that I invest in. So uh, not only that, but it's not even really a potentially, um, a, it's not the business model isn't super attractive. So growing and, and you know, supplying um, highly regulated uh, cannabis products is sounds like it's super capital intensive even once you get it up and running and the return might not be there you don't know what's going to happen to demand that's going to depend as much on regulatory things as anything else so you can't control your demand you can't really predict your demand that well and it's super capital intensive basically on the basis of that you know the fact that it's based and it has a lot of operations in Australia I don't like like I'd probably prefer it if it was in America but even if it was in America, I don't see these kind of businesses as a particularly attractive business model. Also, you know, it's just a sector that's had a lot of um, hype in the past and it's sort of that hype's gone away now. So the momentum's against it. I would see no reason for owning this one. Okay, that's pretty much an avoid then from you. Yeah. Carl, how, how are you seeing it? Um, particularly what you're seeing on the chart at the moment too. Yeah, look, pretty similar, unfortunately, if you've got shares in Can Group. Look, I know the last time it got a pulse was sort of end of 2020, just looking at the chart, uh, when cannabis stocks were the hottest things on the market at the time. And and that's the risk, I guess, of investing in these fads uh, is they're great when they're on, but you do need to know when to jump out when they're not. So it's a confidence game, it's a sentiment game, it's a momentum game. So you need to have some technical indicators, dare I say, to tell you that, hey, you know, my, my initial, original thesis of this, if I had one, is, is no longer in place. So, you know, get some moving averages on your chart. Um, if, you know, I like to use a combination of short-term moving averages and some long-term moving averages. And the short-term ones, I use my 21 and uh, 34, and long-terms, I use 144, 233. So there's some uh, insider secrets there. Um, you know, watch for short-term trends to change, watch for long-term trends to change, and, and you know, take your cues from those because it's what the rest of the market is telling you. Now, if you'd followed those, you would have got out probably around about March this year, and you wouldn't have touched it since because it has been in such a well-entrenched downtrend, both short-term and long-term since then. And volume has gone from this explosion back at the end of 2020 to absolute flatline. I mean, this thing has got very little volume, very little interest. It really doesn't have a pulse. And that might confuse, uh, might, I'm going to confuse people with the next sentence, which is you probably can hang on to it if you've got it just on the basis that there's this huge base pattern. You see how flat it's gone at the end of that chart we were just looking at, complete flat line. It's, there's probably little downside from here, I would suggest, and famous last words, but that's such a base pattern. I'd say it's found this equilibrium. Uh, whereas if it can get some good news out, maybe it can go back up. When that's going to occur, I have no idea because it doesn't look like it's going to occur anytime soon. So if you've got it uh, and you've got nothing else better to do with your money, hang on to it. But geez, I can't buy this one. If you've got nothing better to do with your money. Mm, with your money. That's, that's not it. a ringing endorsement as I see it. <laughs> no. Nonetheless, you've got a hole in it. So fair enough. Take your point. Okay, let's uh, wrap up the first half of the show there. We began uh, our stock of the day, City Chic, the fashion retailer there. Um, Carl saying, in impressed by the company. Uh, he's got a hole in it. The Claude saying, he's not particularly impressed by the numbers. In fact, he's got a sell on City Chic. Our first stock as picked by you, Sensen. Now this is video analytics, uh, particularly in Australia, they look at uh, trying to stop fuel theft at um, service stations. They also have presence in uh, traffic monitoring in Singapore, as Claude points out. He's avoiding it, though. Um, and uh, Carl essentially got a hold on it. 
Archer Materials, an interesting company, as, as Claude pointed out there, essentially starting off as a uh, resources company. It's now into nanotechnology and the like, uh, although not making money, as Claude points out. Um, he's avoiding it. Uh, Carl, though, saying, look, had a really big rally yesterday, so he just wants to watch it, see what happens over the next few days to see whether that holds. Um, so it is a hold with a watch on Archer Materials. IGO. Um, now, uh, Carl calling it one of the best looking charts uh, on the index at the moment. It is in the portfolio. It's staying there. Both have a buy on it. Uh, Carl saying it covers all the bases just as far as that EV revolution is concerned. Um, Claude's saying, look, he doesn't really invest in resource companies, but if he was to, this would be the one. And Globe International also in the portfolio. It's staying there. Um, Claude has a buy on it, uh, brand owner. Uh, in fact, he's saying he initially sold it before it took off, um, but he sees some um, uh, potential sales momentum there. And Carl's saying, um, from a technical perspective, it does look good, although it's thinly traded, he's got a hold on it. And finally, just there, uh, Can Group. Um, Claude's saying, look, it's beyond his risk spectrum, so he's avoiding it, uh, pointing out it's very capital intensive. And uh, Carl's saying it's all about momentum for these sorts of stock. And he sort of says that was pretty much all over um, this past year, although he does see a huge base pattern there. So potentially a hold on CAN. OK, so let's move on to our second half of the show. And this is IDP Education. It is the language testing student placement company. Um, however, there is concern there, obviously, with COVID, what that does to the company. Omicron, of course, those cases surging across the globe. That could be having a negative impact on the business. Uh, Peter saying share price moved down some 20% since mid-November. Is this a recovery trade, he asks? Has the fundamental been changed or progress, progress being interrupted by Omicron? In fact, uh, Carl, I might start with you, uh, just what, what you're seeing on the chart there as far as the IDP education is concerned. Yeah, a pretty good looking chart. I mean, no, no major complaints here. I mean, long term trend. And we talked uh, earlier on about this idea of a core portfolio versus maybe the risk money bets. And I think, you know, this is one of those you could look at your core portfolio. So uh, great, wonderful long term uptrend. Um, just a short-term downtrend that we're dealing with. However, uh, we are pulling back to some really key areas of support. I think this sort of 30 to 32 zone um, will be will be uh, an important area. Um, it's probably just a little bit too early for me to call it a buy. Um, there, there have been some nice candles coming in. So the candles you want to look for uh, in support zones. It's one thing to say, I think there's going to be support there or I think there's going to be resistance there. That's just what you think. The next step is to say, well, what does the market actually do there? What does the market think at those levels? And if you think there's going to be support at a particular level, um, and you start to see the white candles come in at that level, and, and or candles with long lower shadows. So long lower shadows are formed when the price um, it sort of uh, you know gets crunched in the morning, uh, but the, the market sees that as a buying opportunity and buys it up and closes it up near the highs during the day. So if you're seeing those candles at a key support level, that's when I think you can also start to think about buying the dip. I'm seeing some signs of that, some signs of that, some lower shadows, some white candles. I want to see more. I think if you've got it and it's in your core portfolio, there's enough in there in the long term trend to hang on to it. I think if you're looking to buy, buy I've given you, given you some great indications of what you need to watch out for. OK, all right. So that's a hold. Claude, what are your yes. thoughts? I actually find a, a little bit to disagree with there. Um, I know that uh, I, I, I know that IDP education is sort of widely considered exactly as Carl said, um, you know, a fairly uh, quality business that you could be part of your core portfolio. And that is in many core portfolios. So that is absolutely, you know, what most people think. And, and perhaps that's right. But I actually take a little bit of a different view um, from this one. So, you know, first of all, this is a recovery trade in the sense that it has been, you know, massively hit by the pandemic and it would benefit for this magical time when people are assuming that the pandemic is over and then things bounce back to how they were before. Um, however, you know, uh, the, the issue here is like that we don't really know when that's going to happen. And in the meantime, in the meantime, you know, they are going down. So their revenue from Asia was down 
in FY 2021, their revenue from Australasia was down um, in 2021. And there was some bounce back in the rest of the world, uh, which was relatively strong. But that is so much smaller than its Asia revenue that, you know, you it doesn't do enough to keep up. So their overall EBIT is down, right? So that's the trend they're on. And people are assuming, perhaps correctly, that things will get better from here, right? And now that may be true. But just because Australia says, hey, we're going to, we're done with the pandemic, everyone get COVID, it's on. That doesn't mean all the people in India and China and all of the other countries in Asia that might be wanting to do these tests and come to Australia, that doesn't mean they're going to, their governments are going to have that approach or they're going to have that approach. We don't really know mm-hmm. when that's going to happen, how it's all going to sort out. But even once it seems that happens, let's look back at their last, their best ever half prior to COVID to think about what things are going to look like when um, when uh, things re- rebound, right? So $84 million half year peak earnings, double that. Now they didn't ever double that, but let's just say that they did. That's 170 million peak earnings. Um, and then a 9.1 billion market cap, even if they rebounce back to their massive profits they were getting before the pandemic, this still is on 53 times earnings. Now in that scenario, Maybe the fact that it's a high quality business and it's going to keep going really well for a long time, maybe that justifies the 53 times earnings. But that's assuming everything's bounced back. So what we need to happen is everything needs to bounce back and then you've just got it at a reasonable price. Mm. So for me, that, that makes it asymmetric to the downside. To me, this, is, this has been, even for a high quality business that many people see as a core holding, for me, it's just been bid up to a point where it doesn't reflect the, the world around us today and you're relying on a big change in the status quo to justify that valuation, which we don't yep. know when that will come. Okay, uh, sell? It, yep. Sadly, yes, although I, you know, that's the bit that I sort of, I just don't see it as that good anymore. Fair enough, all right. Okay, we better pick up the pace as we're getting towards the, uh, the end of the show. Uh, we're on to Home Consortium. Uh, James wanted to know about this. He's holding some, but not quite confident at the moment. It is a property group um, anchored by some of Australia's most successful retail organisations. Claude, Home Consortium. Uh, yeah, look, you know, this is a, a, a decent retail play, I guess, but um, I'll, I'll sort of make it easier and save a little time on this. This kind of thing is really not for me. I don't invest, except if there was some special undervaluation situation, I don't tend to, and I don't see that here, I don't tend to invest in sort of listed real estate play at all. Most people, myself included, are already leveraged to the property market through their primary residence. So for me, it doesn't hold attraction, even though this kind of thing could do really well in an inflationary environment because land tends to do well. For me, it's just uh, not sufficiently attractive there. Okay. I would call it a hold, I guess, because some people might have their reasons for holding it. But yep. for me, I couldn't say bye. Fair enough. Carl, what are you seeing? Yeah, look, I mean, it looks looks pretty good on the chart. I mean, bottom left, top right overall. So it's it's a hold on that basis. Short term, it's it's a little bit flat. Um, so it's, you know, I mean, I, I, I put out a, a list on Twitter each day uh, of my scam list of stocks that are ready to go. So let's say it, this one wouldn't be on there. But um, I could see if it started to pop in some white candles through eight bucks, you know, it might make a list like that. Um, so, but now it's a, it's a little bit flat. So look, if you've got it, there's definitely enough in to hold it. I'd start to get concerned if we're starting to see it close below $7. Um, but, you know, there's there's a bit of uh, room, uh, a bit of room between before we get there. So yeah. no, look, it's, it's a hold. Um, I can't buy it. Okay, double hold on Home Consortium. Let's move on to MSL Solutions. It is a tech company that uses a software as a service platform to provide services to the entertainment, sporting, hospitality sectors, allows those businesses to connect to their customers, um, also monitoring entry and exit and the like, back of house, front of house. You get the, get the gist of it, I think. Claude, MSL Solutions. Uh, yeah, so MSL Solutions is actually a stock that I own and uh, I sort of bought it uh, sometime in, towards the end of last year, but before the Omicron wave, right? And that's kind of important because uh, this, you could think of MSL Solutions as somewhat of a recovery play. And the main reason for that is that its specialty, I guess, is a point of sale um, software that primarily 
services, I guess, like clubs, sporting stadiums is like their main growth area where they've been making um, headway lately. And, um, you know, they have golf club business as well. And so it's very much, uh, you know, I thought previous to the Omicron, like popping up, you know, I thought, oh, we're probably going to be in a time where they're going to have some um, good business. People will be coming back to stadiums a little bit more. This is because, you know, the vaccine was largely working against Delta. And so I bought that. And um, basically where it is right now and is a journey is it was IPO. It was a terrible IPO. Uh, it was overpriced. It didn't deliver at all. It went right down into the doldrums. And then since then, they've had new management come in and basically make a couple of acquisitions that focuses them more on um, the uh, point of sales kind of side of the business and less so on like the golf and other kind of random software they had. And the most important thing is they've turned it into a uh, net operational cash flow positive in FY 2021, even despite the pandemic, right? And so that's key because that means you're no longer sort of so beholden to having to raise capital on the market even as you lose it constantly because mm. in that scenario that's you can get right in the hole so these guys have at least passed that so if they have um if they struggle to grow they still won't be in a tough spot they've also just raised capital so they have heaps of cash and they've got a strategic investor that's supposed to help them expand into america um they already have a fair bit of business in australia and they've been winning business in the uk so i hold that and i bought it sort of at around current prices from memory um but I bought it before the Omicron thing came up. And I do think that there's some potential that that'll weigh on the share price a little bit. Obviously, it's slightly bad news for us all. Uh, but, you know, still longer term, because these, as long as these guys kind of keep on keeping their uh, cash flow healthy and they've got heaps of cash in the bank, then they can afford to wait and they'll be there when there is a recovery in these kind of stocks. So okay. I quite like MSL. Um, just that note of warning. It may have some volatility I didn't foresee when I bought it. All right. So it's, it's a hold. Um, Carl. Yeah, look, it's actually one of the few stocks on this list we actually do cover. So we've covered it since okay. October. Um, we've had a buy on it since then. It's about the same price. Uh, we're pretty similar to Claude, actually. I mean, we, we like the business. We like the fact it is operational cash flow positive. Uh, it is, look, unfortunately, one of those sort of high PE stocks, but with great growth. So that PE is going to come down fairly quickly. But uh, that could be a reason why it hasn't um, shot lights out since uh, October when we recommended it. Um, also, Omicron is, is having an impact. Having said that, given those negative headwinds, the share price has held up very, very well. So I think that does speak to the underlying quality in the business and a lot of those positives that uh, Claude has mentioned. So, look, on the basis uh, of its relative strength compared to you know the challenges it's had since we recommended it, I would certainly continue to call it a hold. I, I, I'm happy to stick with our original recommendation and, and uh, leave it as a buy, actually. Okay. So uh, the chart looks great, bottom left, top right, yeah. it's just consolidating, happy to call it a buy. We've got a fair value target of 39 cents on this one, so plenty of upside. All right. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just... Yeah. I'll just jump in. I think I came across too negative. Like I'm a bit negative short term, <laughs> but for me, this is this is still a, a buy for me. Like actually, when I look to deploy capital, I'm um, in my self managed super coming up this year. This is one of the ones on my list, so I could see myself buying some of this. All right, good one. All right, so we've got a double buy on it. That means MSL Solutions is going into the portfolio. Well done. Okay. All right. Uh, our ninth stock is Costa Group Holdings. Um, now, this is fruit and veg company. In fact, I think it's signed a, a new lease with Vital Harvest. Um, Claude, yeah, fruit and veg. And I imagine it's probably being hit right now, given we've got the supply chain issues uh, which are playing out across the country. Yeah, look, I'm not an expert on the impact of that on this business, but of course, the transport costs should should be painful for them. and and all sorts of disruption there. But even just looking aside any short-term worries, if we look at the long-term charter, you know, this has been a totally overvalued business for so much of its listed life. And just your basic Buffett principles of, you know, what to look for in a good quality business should tell you that this is not really a good quality business. It's capital intensive. It's at the behest of the drought or the flood or the thunderstorm. Um, and it, from what I understand, it doesn't even like own its land, right? So that's what you really want in, in this kind of business. And this actual listed entity doesn't. So it'll just be a hard no for me, thanks. All right, okay, straight to the point. Carl, how are you seeing it? 
uh, look, it's in trouble. And uh, yes, yeah, so it's not, uh, obviously they, they grow, they grow a lot of the fruit and vegetables themselves. Um, so that's a tough business as it is. Obviously you've got uh, the, the weather's an issue, then you've got uh, you know, markets and marketing to deal with, and you've got transport uh, as well and supply chain issues because of COVID. So, you know, just straight away, it seems like there's a lot uh, potentially going against them. Uh, the chart is kind of speaks to that, doesn't it? I mean, the, the big drop in May last year, you can see it was actually looking pretty good up until then. Uh, that was just a profit downgrade. And we talked earlier on in the session about a big rise. Uh, it was an arch of minerals. So, so it's, the, it's the opposite psychology now. When you have that big rise, you want to watch that stock because um, if it doesn't pull back, it, it speaks to the demand that remains in the system and the lack of uh, supply potentially that you just need to get over. Uh, now here, when you have this big drop, this huge black candle, I'm talking about that huge drop in May um, for the technical analysts out there or the budding technical analysts, go and find a candlestick chart of this one. Um, it's a similar sort of idea. If you can have a, 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 drops on the chart aren't necessarily a bad thing if you recover quickly, but when you don't, and that's what happened here, you've got this bunch of uh, candles um, occurring inside that black candle range, it, it, it's a it's a major, major red flag uh, that this thing is not going to bounce. And if you're a holder and you got caught off guard by that drop, that, it, you know, you really do want to get out of this one. Uh, it hasn't recovered since then. There's nothing in the chart that I like here. I've seen some maybe with downtrends where there's some things I like. There's nothing I like in this chart. Um, so I would have to say, therefore, it's a sell for me. All right. That's brutal, but um, fair. Um, so Brutal, but no honest. Yep. Yeah, yeah. No, we like that. So a sell. So cost group, both avoiding it at this point or just getting rid of it. Okay, finally, let's finish with high pages. Um, Alicia wanting to know about this. It is the online platform. It has that, uh, it is the software as a service, essentially connecting consumers with tradies. I'll put my hand up. I've used it. Um, now, I think there are about 30,000 tradies using it. And in fact, um, just taking a look that Goldman Sachs has a buy at uh, a price target there of 515 and it's currently at $3.70. Carl, I might start with you given what's going on in the chart then at the moment, how you're seeing high pages. Yeah, that's particularly bullish from Goldman Sachs, isn't it? Um, yeah, I'm just, I've got to, uh, my fundamental spreadsheet. I'm going to punch that up on the site here because that that that's piqued my interest there. Uh, look, the chart looks pretty good, pretty good. It's a bit like home consortium, you know, long-term uptrend, but it's just flattening out. You can see that uh, trend there from September to January has gone completely flat. Now, again, that's not such a bad thing. You know, if it's a core portfolio holding, you know, as, and as long as management keep doing what you thought they're going to do, that's fine. But uh, it does give this, uh, it, give the, it gives us this sort of inflection point. You know, do we break out through the top of that range? And then absolutely wonderful, fantastic, hang on to it and add to your position. Why not? When they break through such uh, well-defined consolidation zones, don't just hang on to your position, add to your position. But it also gives us a bit of a sort of a get out um, point as well. So uh, I'll just check my chart and I'll give you a number. If it closes below 342, let's say if it closes below 340, I think you start to need to think your, rethink your strategy on this one because not just the flatness of the curve, but the candles. The candles I'm looking at, uh, they went from predominantly white up until September to predominantly black. So that starts to tell me that there's a bit of distribution in the system. So it's had a good run and there is a big shareholder just sitting on this thing. When the ASX is up, uh, they're sitting on it, they're selling it. When the ASX is down, they're still selling it. Um, so I'll just be a little bit um, a little bit careful about this one. So it's a hold for now, but hey, if it breaks out, add to it. If it breaks below 340, I'd say get out. Yeah, okay, that's some good directives right there. Claude, high pages, what are you seeing? Um, so I guess one thing to keep in mind is that uh, Goldman Sachs were the lead manager of the IPO. So ah, ah, um, that makes know, sense. Yeah. there's that association, <laughs> maybe they know the business really well and they know something we don't. Um, look at their valuation looks a bit high to me. Uh, as far as I can see, it's, you know, a hope that it's going to uh, break even kind of thing. It's not really a profit business yet. I guess the bigger term picture here is they're trying to make it like, oh, you know, they want to be, say, the car sales, except they're finding a tradie. Now, I don't know if it's really going to work out like that for them, but they could at least be a very powerful um, advertising and workflow um, company for tradespeople. And that in itself could be valuable, even if it's not an amazing network effect business. If it ever gets to that network effect stage, uh, it's going to have a lot of pricing power, but that sort of implies that tradies can't advertise in other ways and but they can jump on google adwords and advertise it in other ways you know so i don't think it's going to be that good 
Um, so for that reason and the recent listing, you know, it's quite normal sometimes for there to be some distribution. Maybe some shareholders have wanted to sell for a while and um, the IPO might be the opportunity for them to do that. They might have escrowed shares even. I don't know in this if that applies in this case. But for me, it's a wait and see. But just with the note there that it is really one to watch because it does seem to have some potential to be quite a high quality business. And um, I could imagine it getting sort of becoming sort of a powerful go to place um, for finding that those kind of trades people. And there can be certain stickiness to that, even if it's not a locked in network effect. So definitely one to watch, but too yeah. early for me to buy. Okay, wait and watch there for high pages. Okay, well, let's uh, sum up where we've been for the second half of the show. And we began there with IDP education and language testing. Student placement uh, obviously had its difficulties through, difficulties through COVID. Um, Carl's saying too early to say if it's a buy, looking for a potential dip, it's a hold. Claude, though, saying it is a recovery trade, but at this point he has a sell on it. Home Consortium, the property group, um, Claude saying decent retail uh, play, but he tends to avoid that space anyway. Uh, he's got a hold on it. And uh, Carl saying the chart looks pretty good. He's got a hold on it. MSL Solutions. Uh, Claude, in fact, owns it, um, saying it's a recovery play, had a terrible IPO, was overpriced, but uh, new management has turned that around. Lots of cash on hand. It's a buy, also a buy from Carl, a high growth stock he's saying. Um, so uh, that means MSL Solutions is going in the portfolio. Costa Group, uh, the fruit and veg company, um, Claude saying an overvalued business, capital intensive. It's a no, it's a sell from Carl in trouble he's saying uh, some major red flags there as far as what he's seeing on the chart and finally there are high pages carl saying chart looking good although it's a little wary just need to watch where it's going it's a hold and for claude uh saying valuation does look a little high although he does have a wait and watch on high pages and that are our 10 stocks plus stock of the day thanks to our guests uh, Carl, thanks for joining us from Think Markets at very late notice. You've done well. And Claude, as always, thanks to you from A Rich Life. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, thanks Claude. I love fun. it when the fundamentals and technicals come together. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Any it's stocks? great to hear the different perspective. Yeah, indeed. Thanks, guys. All right. Now, any stocks you'd like us to cover, you can flick us an email at the call at ausbiz.com.au or you can tweet us at TV. And a reminder where to find those stocks we have in the calls portfolio you can head to osbiz.co forward slash portfolio. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to the Osbiz newsletter while we're at it. Uh, you get all our views, the COB podcast and popular videos. So you can subscribe at osbiz.co forward slash the COB. Thanks for watching. wider trading stock and trying to capture those big big medium term trends. Generally I like my trades to have a, a reward to risk of 1.5 or 2 to 1. The bulk of the money is being traded right now on, on this exactly this sort of research. The trade is brought to you by markets.com. The world of financial markets, your way. Make the switch today.